There's a story about Confederate General Stonewall Jackson that comes out of his famous Valley Campaign of 1862 that I think is going to serve as an introduction for the sermon series uh, for the next five weeks that Pastor Nancy and, uh, and I would like to share with you. I'll explain that in just a minute, but here's the story. At one point in the multi-year battle over the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia, Jackson's army simply found itself on one side of a river, it's nondescript, we don't know which one, when the army needed to be on the other side of the river. And it was a significant enough issue where some things needed to happen in order for that to take place. And so he called his engineers in to plan and build a bridge so the army could cross. And then he called his wagon master in to tell him that it was urgent that the wagon train cross the river as soon as possible. The wagon master immediately started gathering all the logs and rocks and fences and rails he could and he began to build the bridge. And long before daylight, General Jackson's wagon master reported that all the wagons and artillery had crossed the river. General Jackson asked where all the engineers were and what they were doing. And the wagon master's only reply was that they were in their tent drawing up plans for a bridge. Leaders and personal growth gurus would say the wagon master possessed something very important, something called a bias toward action. And a bias toward action simply means that you would rather make a decision instead of waiting. Or you would rather take action rather than wasting time. People who have a bias toward action ask questions like, what can I do right now? What needs to take place right now? What information is needed in this moment in order to take action? What action can I do to move forward most effectively? Why have a bias toward action? Well, because if you want to change the world or make something happen, like get an army across a river in a timely manner, then inaction threatens any chance of seeing success. The world around us is generally predisposed to maintain the status quo, and any change is incremental, slow, and very gradual. But people who have a bias toward action bring a positive kind of impatience to change for the better. And that's exactly the kind of people we ought to be. Nancy and I read for you this affirmation and it finished with these words. We are an Easter people. We know what is true and we know that that must lead us to be a different kind of people. A people whose belief in the message of Easter and the change that can occur in our lives and in the world won't let us stay silent and won't let us be still. We have something to share and we have a lot to do. We're going to take you through a five-week sermon series titled The Conduct of a Christian. And it is based on this foundational point. We are Easter people and a people who have a bias toward action. First Peter is a book that affirms this reality. The author did indeed teach the people through this letter that they are to be active followers. The setting of the letter is about 30 years after Jesus rose, about 65 AD is when it's dated, and surely some of the Christians in, the, in one of the five Roman provinces or areas where uh, there was a larger metropolitan sort of gathering in Asia Minor, they've they've begun to waver. They've, they're starting to lose their nerve, and there's a good reason for that. It's because there's all kinds of incorrect teaching happening, and there is a lot of suffering through persecution, uh, and this is starting to um, upset the early Christians. 
And so this letter was written to encourage and remind them of all the benefits of following Christ, even in the midst of the difficult times that they face. They were not to stop. They were not to give up. In fact, he pleads with them to keep their bias toward action. And I think this series will paint with very broad strokes why and how they are to do that. The Acts passage that I just read for you also reflects this bias very clearly. Peter is preaching. Those who are listening are so moved that a single question is asked. Verse 37 says this. Peter's words pierced their hearts. And they said to him and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? The question is, what should we believe? The question is, what should we do? Not what should we think, not what should we plan, not what should we consider, but rather what should we do? It's the early Christians' bias toward action. They were baptized, they received the Holy Spirit, and then encouraged to be set apart for the world around them, or from the world around them. I think most of us know that those who follow Christ are set apart, not just by what Christ has done, but by the actions they take as they follow Christ. And in this first particular conduct of a Christian, we are set apart by our ability to obey as followers. Our obedience drives the bias toward action in the scripture we heard today. In other words, there is a reason for our obedience The reason we obey is so that we might love genuinely, even when loving looks a little different to the rest of the world. Obedience that creates a bias toward loving one another is the conduct of a Christian. Verse 22 in 1 Peter, You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth, so now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all your heart. Now, we don't have time to unpack what that means, what loving means. In fact, there aren't enough Sundays in the year to actually do that. So I'll simply suggest what I've been suggesting all along this morning, that a follower of Christ is called to love the people around her or him actively by choice. You and I ought to have, one more time, a bias toward action. How are those around us convinced that we choose to follow Christ? Well, it's not exclusive to the point, but people tend to believe our love for God when they actively see it, and better yet, when they receive it from us. And that brings up a very interesting point this morning. How are we supposed to do that still stuck in our houses waiting for the green light or our area to become a green zone? Well, that's a good question. First, I want you to look around. Some of you have other people in your house. Those are the other people you should be thinking about. Now, I'm not one to look at a negative situation and pretend there's a positive, How could coronavirus lockdown be positive? Yet, there is a positive to being stuck in the house all day, all week, all month, for a couple of months. You and I get to practice loving each other better. And doesn't that sound wonderful to all the sisters and brothers out there? I don't mean, I mean real sisters and brothers who would rather throw things at each other than uh, maybe do something else. I wonder if this is an opportunity to repair shaky relationships or learn how to play together again. For example, just yesterday, the Kirpata family had some dinner from the grill, and then we made some s'mores, and those were pretty good, and then we created a game of backyard marshmallow baseball. Sure, the boys sent a few marshmallows into the neighboring backyards, but that's not the point. The point is, There was a moment in time where loving, just being in relationship, was seen and enjoyed within the family. 
and there are plenty of other ways to do that sort of thing. Just be creative with or without marshmallows. Now, to those of you who are home alone, your situation is unique and special, and I think you might rightly argue with me that there's not much you can do, even though you are obedient to Christ. To whom can you show love stuck in your house? After all, there's no one else with you. Well, sometimes love isn't seen even though it's expressed. So how about a prayer? How about a prayer offered? That would be a beautiful expression of love and a clear bias toward action because of what you believe. How about a note written or a card sent or a mask made or a wave to a passing male person an encouragement to a grandchild caring for an ailing spouse listen the list can keep on going it's just limited by our own creativity all these meet the criteria of the conduct of a Christian please those of you in this situation don't underestimate your worth and necessity of any one of these ways or in so many others to show love out of obedience to Christ. I'll close with this. Presbyterian pastor, author Clarence E. McCartney wrote, too often in human life, enthusiasm is aroused, emotion is stirred, noble goals are glimpsed, high purposes are entertained, but no action follows. Nothing is done about it. The splendid enthusiasms are wasted and the emotions are dissipated. The soul has not capitalized on what it desired, but did not will. We're reminded today that Christians are Easter people. We believe Jesus came to change the world. We also believe that as followers of Jesus, we want to do the same. We have a bias for action, that is to obey, and in obeying, loving the world, even stuck in our homes, deeply, with all our hearts. That is the basis for the conduct of a Christian.